Public Library Board of Trustees is called to order. Um, and since we're in front of a camera tonight, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves and go around. Jen, can we start with you? Just raise your hand and say your name. And Jennifer Mine, I'm an administrative assistant for Sarah Meyer Ryerson. And I am Linda Podaski, and I'm a board member. Jim Jansen. <coughs> James Curry. Deanna McHugh. Ross Helgehold. Aaron Jones. Diana Blake. Elaine Main. Brian Bergen, city council member. And Sarah Meyer Ryerson, library director. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, first thing is are there any changes or additions to the agenda for tonight? We have a motion to approve the agenda. I move approval. Second, Second. that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to the minutes. Did everybody have a chance to review the minutes that were sent out before the meeting? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, are there any uh, changes to the minutes for tonight? Um, on number four on the motion that I made for the um, bookmobile, I, I think um, it would be a little more clear. And Linda, I will send this to you so we can get it in. Um, OK, I tried to get it as close that's, to that's okay. um, wording as possible. If we change it to Jones move to approve the recommendation from specialty vehicle services consultant. Oh, I see. You Michael switch phrases. OK, gotcha. Michael Swingerowski to contract with Faber specialty vehicles to build a library outreach vehicle with, quote, all standard bookmobile items, in quote, specified by the consultant all, quote, optional bookmobile items, end quote, with the exception of the extended warranty, a video security system, and interior LCD monitor. And then there was a second by Blake on that one. Um, I've been reading Robert's Rules of Order, and it is no longer necessary to, uh, well, maybe it never was, but seconds do not need to be recorded. So I am not recording seconds. They need to be made, but they don't get their name in the minutes. All right. I move we approve the minutes with that change. I will second that. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, moving on to the financials for October. Uh, Sarah? Okay. Um, we've got, should have four sheets of financials. If anybody needs an extra packet, I've got a few more printouts up here. But I'm looking at the, the line item page, the budget report for October. And we are, we would be one third of the way through. Um, and as you can see on later sheets and on the big spreadsheet, we've got, we've spent 34% of personnel. So, and there has been one extra pay period there. Um, but it's, it's, it's tight and utilities are tight. So it's, we're still fine. We might just have to make some adjustments, uh, a few small adjustments in hours for, for salaries. Um, have we noticed an increase in our gas price? I have not noticed it. Um, I know from Wood River personal home bill already. <coughs> I haven't seen a bill. You, oh, sometimes for a while. Okay, because the city pays for it. The city processes okay. those Wood but River. But takes it out of our budget. Yeah, but let's see the that bill on the next page of. Um, expense history report with all the checks I see we paid $851 to Wood River how does that compare Jenny to what we would normally pay them is that in the ballpark I'd have to look yeah and I can surely look that up and send it out and I was get curious to Sarah. we're gonna sure pay it whatever it is but I was curious yep. I did notice my home bill had increased Jenny did check with, uh, double check with Waverly Utilities and our electric costs. We can, especially as we're budgeting for next year, we could plan on a 3% increase in electric. So. Uh, I was gonna see if there was, that I would entertain 
questions about any specific items? The, the printed notepads, were, those were part of a program? Or? I think uh, Chris took those with her when we had a table at the Wartburg Renaissance Fair. Ah. So we were encouraging Wartburg students to use their public library. But I think we may be doing more of those as time goes on. And I saw the microfilming um, cost on page three, about halfway down. Yeah. It says Soldiers Archive, or? That was, uh, that was microfilming some, or, or I'm sorry, digitizing some very old records that we have. Um, Grand Army of the Revolution. Uh, Grand Army of the Revolution. Republic. What? Of the Republic. Grand yeah, you're right. You're right. Grand Army of the Republic. And um, I was thinking Revolutionary War. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that they actually did for us. I think back in 2020, and um, we're we somehow uh, didn't get that paid then, but. They reminded us, and so we paid it. And it's it's available on our um, our digital records section on the web page if you go under local history. So, but I um, I haven't looked at it closely to see exactly what all's there. But uh, I think people can trace soldiers who were from our county. So. Uh, the only, another uh, line item that I was go going to point out that is a little tight and I can, we can uh, switch gears on that one is the library programs line and that is the one that the um, notepads came from. So we've spent $1,085 out of that line already and that, that would go for various programs that we've done, any additional supplies that we've needed um, that the friends didn't pay for because they, they do Sponsor, they do pay for um, a number of the programs, any of the supplies that go with that. Um, but we've got $914 left, so I'll just let the appropriate staff know that what, what we've got left there. Other than, other than making a few um, corrections, um, we're, we're in good shape, I think. And we've got plenty of time in the year left to to change. I see under our revenue report, if we're there now, that we haven't got our county money yet. Actually, we have and since, finally since the, the end of October when this was printed, um, we have. Okay. And so we've gotten our first check of, I'm, sh I'm sure it was 33,000. 32,000. 32, yep. It's a very similar number to what we've had in the past. Surprise, surprise. Um, I should, I should point out on the revenues that the library um, duplicating, so all of our copies or printouts from, from the public printers, um, that we've taken in $1,459, and we had budgeted $2,500, so we're actually, it, it's looking like we're gonna exceed what we planned to take in there. And library fines, we've taken in $1,126. That title is a little bit of a misnomer because actually this would be um, replacement cost of, of items, but the guest number that, that, the educated guest number that I put in there of 2,000 at the beginning of the year, that's actually looking like we're gonna hit that pretty close to. That surprised me, $490. Do, does the library charge themselves when they make copies? No. Because I could see where that would, no, well, yeah, staff, if staff make okay. any personal copies, they put money in. Just personal? Yeah. Okay. But no. Wow. I think that's all I've got. <laughs> Can I get a motion to approve the financials for October? Move to approve. Second. First and first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all in favor? Uh, moving on to our 
Personnel and Policies Committee. Yes, we met, and we're looking, we're trying to review all the policies every three years. So this last meeting in October, we reviewed the public, the loan and billing <coughs> policy, and you have a copy of the revised one in the packet. Um, looks real clean. Sarah, thank you for all the suggestions. I have one suggestion yet on, we have some of the procedures listed on loan and billing, and many of these changed when the library went fine free, and that's, we're kind of catching up and trying to make the policy look like it's not a hangover, but this is our policy and not just got a bunch of things crossed out. So when we changed our procedures on page two, I'd suggest that instead of saying number one and number two, we use bullets like we did with the next <coughs> set of materials okay. so that there's a correlation there and it doesn't look like it's That'll be left yeah. over from something else. Very good. So that's just an editing thing. Okay. So. The committee moves that we accept this as change. I have, a, I have a question. When something comes via interlibrary loan, does the lending library uh, place a fee against our patron if it comes back late? Um, usually not if it's late, um, but if, if it goes beyond a certain point, they will send us a bill for the item. And every once in a while, Every once in a while, you might see in the checks that we would have to pay for a book to another library, but um, no, they don't, they don't charge per day fines on interlibrary loans. Do we collect from the patron then? Yes. Yep. So that could be some money that you see come through the fines as well. So just to make sure I was understanding what you said, Elaine, this procedure yeah. that yeah. began back in 2007, that third sheet. I'm sorry. But so the procedure for library materials long yeah. overdue. Oh, long overdue. Yeah. Yep. And oh, this says to begin January 1, 2007. I guess so we didn't look at that one very closely, but that one needs <laughs> some editing too. Yeah, and I, you know, it still has verbiage in here about late fees, which obviously we're not specifically <coughs> assessing um, overdue charges. So maybe just a little tweak there on the yeah. procedure about any late fees that may be applicable or something, and just making that a little more generic. Yeah, I'll definitely make those changes. Uh, I'm sure that the staff has already changed the language on the mailers. Well, mostly it's email that goes out automatically from the system. I did have the Iowa code that's on the back. Um, I did have our, um, I was almost going to say intern, but Trevor's actually, he's an employee of ours, but he's a student at University of Iowa right now. He, I had him look up and make sure that nothing in that law had changed, which I hadn't heard that it had, but just to make sure in that amount of time. He said it's identical, so, but yeah, thank you. Okay, so what you're referring to, Deanna, is in number two? On the procedure, she was referring in to both number one. two and number three, first bullet, there's under, a reference to under late interlibrary loans. loan procedures, right? Libraries will be Yeah, this third page of the, if you've got the printed packet, the third page that says procedure for library materials long overdue okay. Okay, to begin two. January 1, 2007. Take that out. Yeah. Yes. And then in, in number two number there. Two. It says you have 30 days to return the materials before your account will be billed for replacement costs and late fees. It almost looks like this just wasn't updated, updated yeah. Yeah. at all. Yeah. So since there, you would be billed for replacement costs, but right. not necessarily late fees. Right. Uh, or there, you know, you could just make it more generic to say mm -hmm. any late fees that may be applicable or something if we had a policy where we were charging 
down the road some special mm -hmm. fee or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really just take out and late fees. Yeah, and then two. in number three, Excuse first me. bullet. Can I interrupt here? Mm -hmm. Take out what Elaine yeah. said? Oh, what we could do, we could just table this until next month until we, I mean, that way we have a better, we're not just creating verbiage on the spot and then, and, and then approving it. I mean, I, I guess I would feel a little bit more comfortable if um, if this was looked at a little bit more in depth and then Although created the way that we... The procedures are things that the staff can change without our approval. Well, it's not policy. That, that it's part not, not policy. policy. Just the first page was policy. So we're basically just have, asking the staff to look at that procedure and make sure it's it's up to date. Okay, yeah. so procedures. Can I see? So we can go ahead with our. So yeah, we've got a motion from committee for approval of the first two pages of loan and billing policy. We got this. Ross, you want to repeat that? Uh, we've got a motion from committee to approve the loan and billing policy, which is the first first page, first page front and back. Yeah, and the rest is procedure. So the policy. Right. To approve the policy. Right. Okay. Thank you. And do we need a second from committee? No. 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 So all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank all you opposed? for catching that. Right. So, moving on to the presentation for our annual report. Okay, I've got a microphone here, so hopefully those in the back running the cable cast can hear me. Um, and you will be able to see on your screens uh, the presentation as it, as it goes here. It's just a short half dozen slides um, that Bethany actually put together for me. Um, so this comes from the annual survey that we fill out for the State Library every year. Just um, they want to know our statistics for the year. You know, how many, how many employees did you have and what did you pay them? How many hours were you open? How many programs did you have? How many people attended? How many items did you circulate? Um, now how many items, after your weeding, now how many items do you have in your collection? Those kinds of questions. So the survey itself, which I think each of you got a copy of in the email, um, is not terribly exciting to look at, but as I read through it, I thought some of these things are very interesting if we could see them in a more um, graphical format. So I, I asked Bethany, can we have some pie charts? And she worked on that for me. So, first, first I wanted to mention just the COVID impacts um, because there were, this year that we're talking about would run from July of 20 through the end of June 21. So that's the year that it covers. And that would have been kind of, for all practical purposes, year two of COVID impacts as far as the annual surveys go. Um, so you'll see, you may have noticed um, that our door counts as far as the number of people coming through the door was down and uh, that the physical material circulation was down. And if uh, the number of programs and the number of or of in-person programs and the people who attended those, that was all down, mostly because we had a lot fewer programs. Um, but they, we did reach out in a number of, we, we made a, an extra effort to keep putting out social media items on a regular basis that we really felt like we got a good response from. I did not bring any statistics on that today. But, I, but there are, because I know that Bethany follows those on Facebook, just our, I think it's Google Analytics that you can look at um, with your Facebook page to see how many, how many um, shares there were, uh, 
how, ma how many people it reached, that kind of thing. Um, the digital material circulation went up, as you'll see in the next slide, and um, the number of virtual, meaning live virtual, like um, Sue is doing story time and kids are watching live, and to-go programs, meaning people are picking up a packet of information that those were mostly um, do-it-yourself kind of things where they were picking up supplies in a packet it, um, on how to make something how, or an activity to do for the kids. So we had both packets for adults <coughs> and children to pick up. So different kinds of programming. This just uh, shows again where we were as far as a library size code and, and notes that this, this year we're in a different library size code that because we went up to 10,394 in our um, census, we are now up with compared to a different peer group. Oh, and by the way, that's one of your handouts tonight. That really large sheet is all of the F, F libraries. So all the libraries that um, we are in a size code with according to the state library. This is just one of the questions asked in the survey. How many paid librarians, how many FTEs do you have? And the answer for us is seven. All other paid staff, full-time equivalents, 4.38 for a total of 11.38 is our FTEs. Uh, this one's very interesting to look at. Where does the money come from? Um, so 91% of our operating budget does come from the city's general fund. 7% um, from Bremer County. Um, there's 1% that comes through the state of Iowa, through the state library and then 1% from gifts. And that would be not, the way we report it for the state is not what we received in gifts, but what we spent in that um, fiscal year. And then if you wanna know where, how we spent it, um, you can see that the, the red section on this pie graph, that's staff salaries and benefits. And so that's, that's a big portion of our budget, um, and that's a big resource that we pay for, an ongoing resource. Um, the library collection is 10%, and that's the number that I think previously in the um, uh, standards, we were trying to hit somewhere between, I think it was between 10 and 13%. And so um, that's a number we should keep watching, even though it's not tied to accreditation anymore. Um, I still think it's a pretty good measure to watch. And then all the other operating expenditures, so electricity, internet, software contracts are actually a big part of that, heating and cooling, everything else, 17%. That, that library collection number of 10%, in the last five years, what's that number, what's that percentage done? Does it stay um, the same? Are we moving up, <clears throat> down a little bit? I'd have to look back to see for sure because I know that it has gone back and forth between 11, 12, 13, and sometimes it depends on uh, how much, what portion of the state library funds we've spent on collection um, because that, I don't, I'd have to look and see if that boosted it up to, um, it seems like not so long ago we did hit 13, but that might have been a year that we weren't spending the state money on some other project. Yeah, 11 strikes me as the yeah. most recent, yeah. so that very well could be a little bit mm -hmm. over the last few okay. years. I think Jim's point is interesting with this chart because you pointed out how as salaries go up each year, <laughs> the percent of what we spend on salaries, you know, if it continues to go up, then what do we do about the other two parts of the pie chart, yeah. our operating expenses and our collection, if we don't increase our budget? And, and those, and the uh, salaries and benefits are, are, not, are not completely under our control. Yeah. Because they're really, it's almost like a contracted service for that. And 
which, which even though we say we set percentage of raises each year, we really follow along with the city model. Uh, we have a veteran staff, a well-performing staff, so that's not a criticism of our staff. However, those, those, uh, those totals are really more locked in than, than the other two. So it, it is just kind of a cautionary note that yeah. we have to always keep in mind uh, how, how we balance those things in our, in our annual budget. Yeah, because the, it's been a very regular 3% um, over the years is usually the increase um, for staff, salary and wages, and uh, the benefits package has been much higher than that. Um, just the insurance industry. Um, so if the services and commodities section of the budget doesn't be similar, then we will see that continue to go down, won't we? Okay, so now we're talking about the collection. How many how many items do we have? And we're just talking physical collection here. And this is, um, for some reason, this sticks in my mind that years ago, early on when we moved to the library, we had somewhere in the ballpark of 75,000 items. 75,000, 78,000. Now that number is uh, 66,000, 365, and we have reduced um, we have reduced the shelving by over 20 years. I'd say we've taken out two smaller shelving units. Um, we have kept the collection well weeded because that is shown to improve circulation. Um, but you can see proportionally how many books we have. 56,000 as compared to DVDs, which is 6,800, which we, by the way, have a really good collection of DVDs. Um, CD books are a small collection of 2,100. And then other items like um, your, where our board games and cake pans and other, other items that we check out are 1,000. So that kind of, you can kind of see how our collection is made up there. It's a cool graph. It is. Mm -hmm. Then this one uh, is is actually a show of both physical and digital items, and um, it's very. It was very interesting for me to realize that because uh, the Bridges Consortium has grown and that collection, the Bridges Collection has grown, and that's our online. Um, where we can download ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. Um, our digital collection actually equals 57, over 57 percent of our collection. So over half of, the, of our collection that's available to our patrons mm -hmm. is digital, but we don't see that part. Um, you can on the on the other um, 43 percent. You can see um, that print books make up 36% of the collection. Um, DVDs make up 4.4%. Um, physical audio is very small at 1.4%. And then there's just an other category, but um, that, that was an interesting find That's to me. That's a powerful thing, and being <coughs> able to see how maybe that has changed over the last... Yes five, ten years. Um, yes, and it, and it really has to do with um, the Bridges collection growing and one thing that we did during during COVID times was that we we basically paid for our own Bridges account. It, it was through the same company, through the same platform, Overdrive, but it was called Overdrive Advantage. We're still doing that where we're building our own collection on the side to make those holds lists go faster and to give our patrons quicker access to some of the more popular items there. So that this is just holding still. The next page we're getting just to, to, oh sure. You know, you, you've said this, but you know, we're getting to the point where only a third of the collection will be actual printed books. Yes, very close. Which, which uh, and, and you said that you are reducing now shelving space. I just wonder what that will do, this trend of moving from printed bigger books to smaller, uh, in fact, sometimes virtual books. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what impact will that have on the floor space that we'll need? 
in the next 10 years? Yeah, I think um, I think it will be a trend that mm -hmm. will continue. I don't think I don't think it's a fast moving trend, and I suppose there's I suppose there's um, some choice in it on our part as far as how how quickly we weed down. But we do that based on circulation. So as people stop using um, print books as much, then it will it will continue to be weeded down. I think um, like other media that we've seen come and go, like vinyl records and video cassettes, I think it will be a very, very long time before um, print books are not a part of the picture. I don't think I'll be around anymore, um, alive anymore. Um, but that that's a very interesting thing to think about. It's it's a question that I've had for 20 years, yeah. you know. So then as far as usage of those items, you can see that 58%, um, and this is only a circulation of physical books, by the way. Um, children's books are checked out 58% of the time if the of the of the physical circulation it's children's books 58% and adult books make up 36% of the entire physical circulation and by circulation we mean checking in uh, checking out and coming back and then the young adult has a spot in there of about 6% of our total physical circulation or physical book circulation so this is just books This, this graph I find really, really interesting. And if you look closely at it, on the left we have physical <coughs> items, on the right we have digital items for checkout. Um, you can see that the scales are different, so we're not comparing apples to apples here, but we are looking at trends for both of them. And we're looking at a three year period, 2019, or what would be 1819, 2020, 2021, in both of those cases. So you can see that 2019 was more of a normal year. And so the physical circulation was 143,000. And that is, uh, circulation usually ebbs and flows between 135,000, 155,000. It's somewhere in there um, most years. and. That was, that was a pretty normal number. Then you get to 2020, and despite the fact that we were closed for 15 weeks in 1920, we still had a circulation of 106,700. But then in 2021, the physical circulation had dropped to just below 87,000. So you can see the steady decline in circulation. Now this year, the year that we're currently in is going to be a really fascinating year to see what that number ends up being. Now, the digital items had the opposite trend, and it wasn't um, it wasn't astronomical, but the percentages are are very strong indicators. So, uh, in 2019, there were 11,000 items checked out digitally. Um, in 1920, that increased to 14,000 and then almost 20,000 in 2021. And the, the difference between um, 1920 and 2021, I believe was about 7%, almost 7%. So I think that's pretty significant that people were learning how to use a different format in a time when their, their physical access to the library was limited. But you look at those numbers for the digital, like we said, I mean, not quite, but almost double well, mm -hmm. from 2019 yeah. to 2021. Yeah. And I really wonder what the impact and understanding of this graph would be if the scales were the same. Mm -hmm. would, would that tell a yeah. different story? Would that tell a better story? Uh, would that help the observer understand the trend better yeah. or not? That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. 
because if it, just at a casual glance, yeah, they can be misleading. I yeah, that's true. Sure. If they were on top of each other, those graphs that that would be on a same scale. Right, or, mm -hmm. or the or the bar. years, mm -hmm. both bars be the same yeah. year to year, mm -hmm. so you can see yep. that occurring. I I'm I'm just throwing that out. No, I think that's yeah. a very good. I mean, it's. It's a challenge to look at all this data and try to make something out of it. You know, try to try to glean something that. What can we learn from from this? You know, I, I guess if we're wondering if we should keep putting dollars into digital items, I would say the answer is yes. I mean, if that was a question. Okay, so here we have another way to look at it. Um, well, this this might be getting more to mm -hmm. what you were talking yeah. about, Jim. Right. Yep. Now, warning, the years go in the opposite direction yeah. on this oh. graph. So <laughs> we're starting with 2019 on the right side and moving left for 20 and 21. So you can see that physical circulation started out at 92%, almost 93 with digital at 7%, and then you get to the, just this past year and you've got physical circulation at 81% versus 18, we're almost 19%. This is the last slide that just shows some pictures of, pictures of ways that we as a staff tried to adjust our services based on COVID. And we've had many conversations about this, you know, in this group, um, but the State Library Annual Survey was asking a lot of questions about, did you provide virtual programs? How many viewers did you have? Um, how, how many um, recorded programs did you um, have? So the picture up at the top left is a, an outdoor movie at Coleman Park that we partnered with the chamber on. Um, Ryan there, Ryan is holding um, a board game, a couple board games that he purchased. He, he developed um, this collection of board games, which I think we've mentioned before too. And, come on in. And uh, those have been circulating really well. Um, the, the next one is a kit that we sent out um, that people could pick up an activity to do with writing. Um, some of our summer programs, the far upper right picture, um, we did some uh, outdoor events for adults um, that year for the summer reading program. On the bottom, you can see, bottom left, you can see Emily doing a story time outside in the parks. Um, you can't see the whole crowd there, but these are the ones where we were getting crowds of 50, 100 or more people um, coming. The next one, we, we circulated a lot of Switch games, Nintendo Switch games, which were very popular, or are, are continuing to be very popular. Bethany is standing there with a, um, a little automatic vacuum cleaner that um, was the adult prize for the summer reading program. And then in the bottom right, this is a little bit difficult to see, but if you look, this is a preschool class in town here, and if you look at the TV that's up on the wall in the corner, you can see Miss Emily, oh. and she's doing a live story time um, via the internet for those kids when she couldn't go there during COVID. So. Those were just examples of some of the programs that, that the staff worked on, which I think they did a fantastic job of adjusting the best we could. Absolutely, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any other questions about numbers that you saw in the annual survey, but if you do, um, I can do my best to answer them now, you can, or you can, send them to me or, or things that you observed about the numbers. I'd really like to know what what you, your thoughts were, so. And this report going to the state? Yes. Okay. And then, you know, back to some of the things about us moving up into that higher F class. Um, yes. Based on population. Do we have access to the 
to the results that get aggregated at the state level so we could see yes. you know what's the typical numbers for a yes. class F library there's a really we, yes there's a really slick um, this system it's a platform called web web connect um, web collect is what we put our data into and then um, we can go and run our own reports on on the on that platform and pick whatever libraries we want. And actually, because, because our reports that we do for the state are standardized throughout the country, um, we can pull libraries from whatever state we want. Yeah. And we can do that by size sizes and, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. The reports that you can run would be inf infinite. Yeah, well, it might be kind of cool just a few of these key slides that were prepared for us how that compares to some other yes. similar libraries. That would be, so. that would be. So I'm noticing on your listing of the new, of all the F institution or libraries, we are the only one in the Northeast District Office. Yes, I noticed that too. Um, do you know where the closest F library is? Aside, like no, where? I haven't, um, let's see. I mean, I don't know if it would be the ones in the um, Cedar Rapids area, yeah, like probably uh, right. or Wapo. Well, North Liberty would be closer. North Liberty and Hiawatha. Than, than yeah. Right. I don't see Hiawatha on here. Oh, I'm sorry. Hiawatha was in the E group before. Right. Yes. So North Liberty. Right. And Coralville, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I've got an observation about the presentation and, and then a possible recommendation. Uh, after having read other annual reports, mm -hmm. a lot of good figures there, but I think this really illustrates some real key information for us and for our public. Mm -hmm. okay. I think this, you know, as they say, a picture tells a whole bunch of words, yep. and this really tells a real clear story. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I'm, I'm going to make a, a connection followed by a recommendation. Uh, in perhaps a year from now, we may be asking our public to support us in a library enhancement. And I think that might give us about a year's time for a fairly focused, I'll say public relations effort through our newspapers, through possibly TV or, or beyond. This is something that I visited with Sarah about this morning, so I'm not trying to surprise her with this. I, I think it would really bo would be good of us to ask our, our library staff to perhaps have a monthly articles in, in the Waverly paper starting as soon as possible. And, and, and they, are, they are connected and they are structured such a way that we are informing our public about our enhancement project, uh, about some of our strengths, uh, current strengths, some of the trends. I think we see some trends daily here, which I think would be very helpful for our public to know. And then as we get into a series of articles, we really talk about what are the next steps for the Waverly Library. And I, I think it could be a really good, uh, P, I'll say just a PR program for our library moving towards where we could possibly be a year from now. So I just throw that out as a, rec not as a motion, but just as a recommendation, probably as much for discussion with us now or later. But I think they, they, you know, it may have some merit doing that. Mm -hmm. Just a sizable story, a sizable. That's right. yeah. um, um, I just want to say I, I support Jim's suggestion about the articles in the paper. Um, I think about the, the huge attendance at the Halloween party. And if people realized how, how that was packed that day, um, they would recognize that the library is the place to come to for a lot of those things. Um, and every t Monday when I come, there's a sewing group going on, and you know, there's something all the time, and we need to, uh, people may know about it, but we need to remind them about it. Yeah, and I think in addition to newspaper, where could we have present it, not present, but have this information available to the people that care that would matter on our web? 
Yeah, I was going to say the See? slides, certainly, if we could post yeah. those on the website, that would yeah. be great. Mm -hmm. And social form. media as well. Social and our Facebook page, you know, some of those key slides <coughs> periodically yeah. using sure. that. The presentation is just outstanding. And can it run on a screen at the library? Yeah, we, we have sure. a dedicated yeah. screen so the patrons coming in can see what we see. Mm -hmm. And I should say that um, we turned this into a presentation now. Um, the, the city council will probably receive a very similar kind of presentation. Maybe we'll, uh, we might tweak parts of it, but this is w kind of what we would get together to, to provide to the city, which is, which is in our um, ordinance that we will do that once a year. Um, and it's kind of a fun meeting to share. Um, also, we'll, we'll change this into another brief report for the county supervisors when we go visit them in January. So this is kind of the data we start out with to build, to build a report. So it, it can look so many different ways, but this was, this was definitely a, a brief version, but um, I think the pictures, the pictures go a long ways too. It shows the, the trend where there's more happening. The library is full all the time, so there's a lot happening there that may not be reading a book or something like that. Um, but there's a lot, a lot going on, and I, I think that um, supports our need for space enhancement. I have to mention the dinosaurs. I mean, <laughs> they're going to get bigger. So. <laughs> well, the, the trend data also, I think, probably begins to ask questions of our patrons that they've wondered for a long time. How do public libraries change over time? Uh, how, how will our library change through the, through the digital age? I think those are things that that board has to address. Staff talks about those things. I think it'd be much better to be a lot more proactive, and, and I'm not saying that because we haven't been, right. but with our public, I think it would be really, I think there's a tremendous story to tell about how the Waverly Library is changing over time with influences like social media, uh, digital media, patron use, how that all blends into today's library. And, and why would we be asking? for more and bigger and better and changing facilities and programs in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's very good, very good idea. And, you know, thank all the staff for the work of getting yes. things put together for the survey and certainly Stephanie for, yes. for putting this together very, very well. Okay. Reports. Uh, is a representative of budget and finance. We are. We're all. We're all right. We've met a couple of times. We still need figures. We aren't ready to come back to you, but we will in December, and that meeting will probably be basically about the budget because then it will have to go to city hall. Uh, we're just waiting on, like Sarah said, she's got some more information coming in from Waverly Utilities. We have to get some on a salary increase, insurance, stuff like that. And before the Budget and Finance Committee leaves tonight, we need to set up our next meeting because we did not. But that's where we are. It, it's looking good. There's, We've got a good foundation. We just need to plug in a few more. The one thing that we talked about uh, during last year's budget, if if every if everyone remembers, is we wanted to keep a, a zero percent increase, and you know across municipalities and local governments, that was kind of one thing that you know a, a lot of people halted expenditures for capital items or or increasing budgets because we weren't sure exactly where we were going to be in a year from now. Well, a year from now, here we are, and so. Um, you know, we we are probably going to see an, a, a small increase in our operating budget, but that's it's overdue. Um, 
and so I, I think that's what we're going to be presenting. It won't be a large increase, but uh, the one thing that was mentioned was materials, and so I, I think that is one thing that we have talked about as well is seeing a, a small increase in materials as well. So, um, but yeah, as um, as mentioned, salary and benefits are are the driver of our budget, and that's just something that's a little bit out of our hands. So. Yeah, just as as you were bringing up earlier, Jim, and. Those are prescribed city increases that are not really in our control. Almost fixed cost. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Everybody that's alive right now knows, knows prices are going up. Mm -hmm. And for whatever we need to operate the library, those materials will go up. And so we have to rather, and if we don't, not buy stuff to keep the collection current, then we'll be in trouble. No. We have to keep the building relevant. Let's see, this, this might be one of these comparative studies with our new F group, is to take a look at their, at their FTEs, mm -hmm. at their budgets for staff, at their budgets for materials, and, and not that, that we have to be like them, but it might just be informative to our budget committee and then later to the board to say, you know, now we have a new peer group. Mm -hmm. How do they compare with our size, staff, collections, that whole business? So just a peer study might be helpful. Okay. All right, and then the building and grounds committee. Um, so just a little history. Um, to, to get people up to date, um, back in 2018, we um, con contra contracted with Kimberly Bolin Associates um, to do a strategic plan um, session. We involved lots of different groups of the community, the staff, or the board, um, and they came back with us with, to us with a very comprehensive um, report. From that, um, we saw that we could also benefit from a space needs study, which they completed in 2019. And um, since then, the staff has been working on what they can do within our current space and layout um, and has come to us with a recommendation that we look at potentially um, expanding our space and uh, reconfiguring uh, this the interior space too. So Building and Grounds Committee has been meeting regularly. Um, this year uh, with the staff's help, we um, selected Studio Melee uh, architecture firm out of Des Moines um, that we've been working with to um, come up with a plan. We don't have that yet. Um, we are still in the design and planning um, phase, but we are re meeting regularly um, and have lots of exciting things to look forward to. When's the next meeting? We meet with them on the 17th. Um, they're coming up here and we're gonna have staff and our committee and their, their people. Yeah, and I would just like to say that I feel like we're we're getting a lot of attention from this firm, mm -hmm. and so I feel yes. like there's some very nice people, and they are giving us giving us the time that we need, and I think that they're leading us through a process that is uh, very helpful mm -hmm. and not something we can ever do on our own. So it's I'm I'm really grateful for them and, and eager to see what they bring. Awesome. All right. Library Foundation. Um, yeah, just uh, real quick, again, for folks who um, may not be aware, we have a separate uh, Library Foundation, 501c3 organization. It is in place solely to help um, support the mission of the library in the community and um, is the place where gifts to the library or directly to the foundation are then managed um, for investment purposes so that they can be used to support that library mission um, now or 
many years down the road as things come up. Um, our library foundation board meets quarterly to review the investment performance and we had our third quarter meeting here recently. Um, we did see there were some volatility in the market as we know and there had been some, some more significant drop there over the course of third quarter but then some recovery in those investments so things were we're looking okay. Our investment advisor um, was looking to put some cash into other investments and making some wise decisions um, to try and deal with that volatility. So that was good. Uh, the uh, gift planning for support of, I know we'll talk in a moment about the outreach vehicle and so that money is, is there to be used as we work to deliver the bookmobile and then also uh, generous gift money to support the space enhancement work that you were just talking about, Erin. Um, and so I think you'll hear more about what the foundation will do with gifts that we have received and, and hope to receive in the future and as we kind of get some of those projects out in the community. And for anybody who's interested in giving to the library, um, whether that's a, a current gift or making plans as part of their um, legacy planning, there's a gift form on the, the website where you can find out more about how to make your gift and, and benefit the library and its programs and services. And uh, just one last comment. Um, we also have a separate endowment fund that is uh, part of the Northeast Iowa Community Foundation. Um, the Waverly Library Endowment Fund can be found on their website or linked to from our website. So if you're interested in making a donation that goes forever and the uh, benefit of earnings on that endowment then can last for our lifetimes and beyond, then that's the place to go with your, your giving uh, as well. So I encourage people to look at those uh, websites and we'll keep having more conversation as some of these big projects move forward. Anything else anybody from the Foundation Board can think of? Thank you. And then the library reaccreditation reaccreditation application progress. So this is the um, from the state library that is the um, public library standards, and I printed off the latest edition. Um, this is what the questions will be when they get them up on the website for accreditation. Um, I have been looking through to see if I could find um, how our F library status will affect us, and it appears to me that in the um, small handful of places where that's mentioned in here that we're already meeting the standard where we're at. So I don't think that will, um, that will affect us, uh, that we will struggle with any of those standards. Um, I did include, uh, I looked back at three years ago when we, fil when we went through this process, um, I made a list of ones that I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was following through on um, and it, I was reminded that the, there is a standard that requests that the board, that every, everyone on the board is recommended to have three to five hours of library um, education, library, um, they're, they're pretty broad with what that, what that education could be, but three to five hours per year per trustee. So I know that some of you have, have gone to some um, events over the last three years and you may have to help remind me um, what those were. I don't have to write, there's, 
I don't have to write them down. I don't have to record them, but, but um, uh, as far as uh, we, could, we could do a few, it would probably be good for us to do a few in the upcoming meetings as well. Yeah. And we could just kind of um, highlight a resource. We can take one of our digital resources and highlight it. Um, there's, there's a number of things we could do that would be very practical learning opportunities for the board. So we'll maybe look at that for um, a brief part of the meeting in December if we have time yeah. with the budget. So so I've got, uh, I'm just going through and trying to again pick out, pick out the ones that um, will have changed from the last three years, so we're, we're still on track. That's due at the end of February, by the way. So, and that would be our accreditation that would start in July of 2022 and go three years. This document, by the way, is is online too on the State Library's webpage. But if anybody would like to look at it, I'd be happy to send you the PDF. All right, and the outreach vehicle. Wow. Yeah. So the report on the outreach vehicle is that um, Diana and I. Um, were able <laughs> to write a very large check um, because of the generosity of Nancy and Wayne Anderson, who gave us this beautiful gift um, from their estate. Um, that's what makes this all possible, um, this bookmobile. And so Diana and I were able to write a check for 50% of the cost of the bookmobile and send it to the company that has been chosen. Um, that bid the project and Farber in Ohio and they received it. They sent me an email, a very happy email when they received it. And now what they, uh, what they need from us is they need us to choose a, a color for the cab, <laughs> the exterior cab of the bookmobile. So that's my next conversation with staff who are, st I have staff members who are working on the, what we want in the design elements for the wrap that's gonna go around the rest of the vehicle. So somehow we'd like to tie that all in, um, but that's just a, another small step in this. And, and I feel very good about still having our consultant, uh, Michael Swindrowski, with us because he's gonna be monitoring the build as it goes through and there are specific things in his contract with us where um, it tells what he'll be checking on and um, just making sure that it's built to the specs that we set out. So it's exciting, very exciting. Uh, of the name that we're choosing to use publicly, are, are, are we are we going with um, outreach vehicle? Are we going with bookmobile? Is there common is, is, as, as as we talk to this to the public about this? Uh, it might be helpful if we all are kind of on the same page. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just wondering if, if you and your staff have some thoughts about what would resonate with the community, how you're explaining this. I'd be glad to align with whatever you, you With decide. the stats we saw tonight, we better be careful about <laughs> book the mobile. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the interesting thing. Um, I feel like the bookmobile, um, both it's a recognizable term to people, mm -hmm. And, it, and for some people, though, it's limiting in that um, they, don't, they don't think like the rest of us probably didn't until we learned more about modern day bookmobiles, about the possibilities that they could bring with them, that, um, that you could have laptops aboard and printers aboard and Wi-Fi enabled um, vehicles. So, um, we have not settled on that yet, but but we, it would be a good idea to figure that out soon. Partly too for 
whatever we call it, you know, in the name on the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. If any of you have thoughts about that, I'd be. I'd love to talk about it because I'm. I'm really divided too because the term outreach vehicle, while maybe more accurate and more general, is not a very exciting, um, right. exciting thing. But Little kids can't say outreach vehicle. <laughs> We've got to have something, something yeah. fun and exciting and you so know appealing. Well, at City Council, we discussed Bookie with Bookface. That's right. That's right. That went over real well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for me. That's right. You did give me that thought. Uh -huh. So we're very open. Well, it is a kind of challenging name because of our demographics. Older people recognize some things, but yes. it, it's we we may be moving away from books entirely, like it used to be in my kids' days. So it, it, it will be interesting to see as you guys generate a, a bunch of different options and names and, yeah. and play that off groups to see what's appealing. Yeah. Right. Okay. We'll continue the conversation. Okay, and any staff reports from the Iowa Library Association? I gave you the one, the written reports that I've received so far. There's a, there will be about this many again, but I just asked each staff member who attended the Iowa Library Association conference to um, just write a quick paragraph or two about a session that really spoke to them at the conference. Mm -hmm. And so I was, it was very, very enlightening to read these because I th it was kind of natural that everybody just kind of spread out and went to different sessions, and um, it was very interesting to see what I missed mm -hmm. because I was at different sessions or to see how someone else viewed a session that I was at, but I think you'll enjoy reading them, and um, I know that the staff is anxious to get together and kind of share with each other some ideas that they hope to incorporate into our operation from these. So. We'll be doing that at one of our staff meetings coming up. And I will um, send out more of these as I hopefully will have the rest soon. Maybe adapt that into an hour of con continuing education yeah. for us. Yeah, for, that, could, that could be for <laughs> there. It very well could be. Yeah, just fun. Yeah. Do we, is there any other business for tonight? I'll just mention that personnel and policies will meet December 15. And <laughs> Sarah and Emily showed us this volume, this book that has come out about yay thick, that is intellectual freedom policies for your library. So now here's what we're gonna check through, a checklist on <laughs> curriculum development. And I was telling Sarah, I kind of worked through it, spent an hour or so, and I think our policy is very good. So, yeah, maybe it's not as threatening as I thought. So we've got about a half dozen policies to kind of test against yes. the updated yes, intellectual freedom list. manual. <laughs> yeah. So that will do December 15th. 8.30. 8.30. 8 a.m. Any other business? Sarah, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, we're adjourned. Personnel in the hall.